Well, so good morning to all of you. We will be continuing our discussions regarding the drift flux model, the things which we were doing in the last class what we did. We discussed about the advantages of the drift flux model and uh, the basic concepts, the concept of drift flux, how it modifies the different mixture parameters namely the void fraction and uh, the uh, mixture density, the local velocities and so on and so forth. And so, we understood that if we have some idea regarding the estimation of drift flux, then once we can incorporate drift flux into the equations which we had discussed in the last class, then we will be in a position to predict mixture properties much more accurately and accordingly we can predict the hydrodynamics of two phase mixed flows as well as transitional flows in a much more accurate fashion. So, today we will be continuing our discussions regarding the different ways or rather the approach to estimate J21 by using different kinematic constitutive equations. Okay. So, we will be discussing basically the kinematic constitutive equations to estimate J21. Now, in this particular regard, I would like to say one thing that there are basically two approaches in order to estimate this kinematic constitutive equations. Okay. Now, one thing is for sure that this particular model is particularly more useful when the relative motion it can be determined by a few key parameters and it is independent of the flow rates of each phase, then only it is much more useful. Now, usually there can be two approaches to find out the kinematic constitutive equation in order to estimate J21. Now, what are the two approaches? One can be that you consider the mixture as a whole okay? and then what we do is that <coughs> we start with the mixture field equations. Okay. So, the two approaches, the first approach is that we start with the mixture field equations and then we apply, let me write down start with mixture field equation equations and then apply various constitutive axioms or other various constitutive laws to the mixture Now, this is one approach and this seems to be quite logical. What we do? We consider the mixture as a whole because in this case we have not concentrated on the individual or rather we have not concentrated on the individual phases. What we have done? We have concentrated on the mixture as a whole. So, what we do? We concentrate on the mixture and then we try to apply different constitutive axioms to the mixture as a whole without considering their individual movements okay, or rather without considering the two fluid model. Two fluid model means what? We will be de dealing with it in much more details in the next chapter the separated flow model. That means, we would be considering the two phases separately and we would like to write down the momentum, the continuity and the energy equations for the two phases. Okay. So, the first approach is we do not consider the two fluid model, we consider the mixture as a whole and in the mixture field equations, we use different constitutive axioms and uh, which is applied to the mixture as a whole and it is independent of the two fluid model. This is one approach. The second approach is that you consider the two fluid model. Okay. In this particular thing, the necessary constitutive equations, just underline this. The second approach is that necessary constitutive equations
obtained by reduction of two fluid model. So, this is the second approach. Okay. In the second approach what we do? We, we consider the, the two fluids separately in whatever way they are mixed okay. and then considering the two fluid model we try to arrive at the necessary constitutive equations. This is the second approach. Now, logically when you think it will you will always be tempted to think that maybe the first approach is much more logical and that should be used because here we are considering the mixture properties as a whole. Okay. So, logically you will think that well we should consider the mixture field equations and then we should apply the various constitutive axioms to the mixture and it should be independent of the two fluid model. But if you notice properly you will find that there are certain problems in using the first approach. Now, what are the problems? The first problem arises from the fact that the two phases are generally not in thermal equilibrium. Now, when they are not in thermal equilibrium, we cannot define an, a particular temperature for the whole mixture. Now, if we cannot define a particular temperature for the whole mixture, then in that case we cannot define the mixture properties as a whole, is not it? The second thing is that we will also notice that the kinematic and the mechanical state between the two phases that is greatly influenced by the interfacial structure and their properties. Is it clear to you? So, therefore, we find that since it is sort of means since the interface properties they are changing or in other words the point is under certain flow conditions you are having bubbly flow, under certain under other flow conditions you are having slack flow. Okay? So, therefore, we find that whether it is whether the dispersed phase exists as bubbles or as Taylor bubbles or maybe as churns, churn sort of thing. This influences the constitutive equation. This influences the mechanical and the kinematic state between the two phases. So, as a result if you consider the mixture as a whole then in that case we are not free to observe what is happening between the two phases, how they are distributed etcetera etcetera. Is it clear to you? So, therefore, we find that this first approach using the mixture field equations and then applying the various constitutive axioms to the mixture that usually it is not very preferred. Okay? And for most of the cases we obtain the constitutive equations by reduction of the two fluid model. Okay? Now, for, now, in order to use this or rather to incorporate these particular effects, the effect that the two phases may not be in thermal equilibrium, the kinematic as well as, as the mechanical state is greatly influenced by the interfacial structure and their properties. In order to account for, for these particular factors, we find that it is simpler as well as more realistic to obtain the equations from the two fluid formulation rather than the former approach. Okay. So, accordingly what, what is usually done? Usually the two fluid formulation is done, the momentum equation for the two phases are written down separately and from that particular momentum equation naturally those momentum equations will be considering some particular term due which arises due to the relative motion. From there the relative motion term is obtained and it is accordingly some constitutive equation is proposed for it and that is used in the drift flux model. This is the approach which is used. Now, is this portion clear to you or should I repeat this part once more? It is clear to you more or less. So, therefore, what we do? You remember one thing that in order to estimate J21, there are usually two approaches that we can use. One is we consider the mixture as a whole and then from there we can find out the constitutive equations. Now, if we have to do this then the mixture has to have more or less uniform properties throughout, but what we find? We find that generally the two phases they may not be in thermal equilibrium and moreover their kinematic as well as their mechanical states it is greatly influenced by the structure and properties of the interface. 
So, therefore, when the interface changes, this kinematic state that is also going to change. Now, if that happens, then in that case, we cannot derive an accurate constitutive equation by using the mixture field equation. What is more accurate? We take up the two fluid formulation. We consider the presence of the two fluids separately. Okay. And how we will consider that the two fluids, they can be in bubbly flow, slug flow, churn flow, the interaction parameters are going to change. So, we will we'll be incorporating these particular, the effect of the flow patterns in the interaction parameters which shall be incorporated in the momentum equation written for phase 1, in the momentum equation written for phase 2. And from there, we would like to see how the relative motion, the expression of relative motion can be derived or the physics behind deriving the relative motion between the two phases. Now, let us then start writing the relative or rather the momentum equation for the two phases. Now, if we consider the two phases, I will just write down the momentum equation, I will not go into much details, we will be dealing with this when we uh, uh, in the next chapter when we deal with the separated flow model, I will just write down the basic equations and then see what best I can do with those equations in order to arrive at the kinematic constitutive equation to obtain J21. Now, whenever we write down the momentum equation, say maybe in the three dimensional form, well I have it here itself. So, in the three dimensional form you find it is, it resembles probably the Navier-Stokes equation which you have already done, is not it? We have a time dependent term, we have an inertia dependent term and then B1 and B2 they are the body forces, okay? body forces per unit volume of the fluid element. That means, this is written for phase 1, this is written for phase 2. Okay? Now, for phase 1, naturally we consider unit volume of phase 1, fine, and here we consider unit volume of phase 2. Okay? And we find, so therefore, B 1 is the body force, which is nothing but the gravitational force, force arising due to gravitational acceleration. So, this is B 1 and B 2 are the body forces per unit volume of components 1 and 2, which act on the respective components. Delta P, this is nothing but the pressure gradient. Okay? So, it is, yeah. Hmm. So, delta P, it is, achha, delta P, it is the pressure gradient and it is the average pressure gradient or the bulk stress which is and it is suitably defined it is usually the pressure difference of one or both the phases and what about this term f1 and f2 do you remember in navier stokes what what was the other term which was there in navier stokes what was the other term the other term was mu isn't it and therefore, for fluid 1, it, it, it will be this, for fluid 2, it will be something else. So, this arise, arise, uh, arose from the viscous terms, is not it? So, the point is, in this particular case, what is F1? F1, F2 are simply what is left over, which has to be incorporated in order to keep the account straight. This is what you should remember. Okay. Now, whatever, when you write down the momentum equation, body forces are there, pressure difference is there. Apart from this, whatever other term should come, which is not included in the pressure gradient, which is not included in the pressure gradient, that is included in F1 as well as F2. So, therefore, F1, F2, they are simply incorporated in order to keep the account straight. Okay, if, if you observe this particular equation, you will find that F1 and F2, they are, they have been incorporated just, they are just leftover forces per unit volume of the corresponding phase. They are simply incorporated to complete the momentum balance equation. Okay? So, therefore, when we were considering that uh, it is incompressible Newtonian fluid containing only one component, which is not undergoing phase change, then F1 will be equal to this. Okay, for Newtonian fluid, this you already know. For Newtonian fluid, it 
incompressible one component and no phase change. This you have already derived. Okay. Now, usually what we find? We find that these f's they represent the average of the total force per unit volume that is not contained in pressure gradient. So, therefore, from where can F's arise? These F's therefore, they can arise in this particular case it was the wall shear stress. Okay. Apart from wall shear stress, they can arise from particle particle interaction if there are if it is gas solid or liquid solid flow then they can arise from particle particle interaction they can also arise from hydrodynamic drag isn't it the drag between hydrodynamic drag or in other words it is the two phase drag okay it, may, it can be between gas liquid it can be between gas solid it can be anything so it can arise due to the hydrodynamic drag it can also suppose there is evaporation condensation etc then what's happening one particular phase it is shifting from say the liquid phase to the vapor phase or vice versa <laughs> isn't it so therefore due to this there's a momentum change of some portion of the fluid which is actually undergoing phase change so, therefore, due to that there is some momentum change. So, that can also be incorporated in F. Okay. So, therefore, when there is a phase change, then forces due to momentum changes during evaporation slash condensation. or it can also be the apparent mass effects apparent mass effects during relative acceleration this can also happen so therefore we find that whatever whatever force the leftover force which is there which is not accounted for the pressure drop thing the, that particular force that is included in F 1. So, therefore, when it is a Newtonian fluid and incompressible in single phase Newtonian fluid flowing through a pipe then in that case you find that your F 1 is nothing but it is the it arises due to the wall shear stress it is this particular thing. Now, when there are two phases we find that it can arise due to number of situations one is interaction between the wall and the fluid maybe interaction between wall and fluid 1 wall and fluid 2 ok. So, therefore, wall and fluid 1 should be included in this F 1 wall and fluid 2 should be included here. It can be the hydrodynamic drag that means fluid 1 fluid 2 that will also be included fluid 1 with respect to 2 will be included in F 1 fluid 2 with respect to 1 will be included in F 2. Okay. Now, when there is some particular condensation evaporation something then then some portion of, of the fluid it is changing the phase. Now, we know that both the fluids are moving at different velocities. So, therefore, when you are changing the phase say when evaporation is occurring some amount of, of liquid is going into the vapor phase therefore, it is changing its velocity say from u 1 to u 2. Okay. So, due to this there has to be a momentum change due to this velocity change. So, that will be incorporated in F 1 and F 2 okay. and apart from this of course, the apparent mass effects during relative acceleration that can also be included. So, whatever is not included in the pressure difference that comes under F 1 and F 2 agreed. Now, remember one thing that quite frequently some portion of this of the effect is included in delta P some portion is not included only that portion has to be included in, in F 1 and F 2. So, these things you have to be quite cautious about 
always it is not very easy to segregate the forces which is not included in delta p and has to be included in f1 f2 these have to be kept in mind clear so therefore whenever you write down a momentum balance equation what are the things definitely there are the left hand side and in the right hand side you have force due to weight of the uh, fluid simply the weight of the fluid which is included in v1 v2 then the pressure gradient and whatever is left over that left over thing that depends on the exact flow situation okay whether it is a change of phase situation, whether the, the, uh, the hydrodynamic drag is important, whether the wall drag is important. So, F1, F2, they depend upon the actual, fl actual flow situation and according to the flow situation, F1, F2 are different and that is why using the two fluid model, we arrive at different equations for different two phase flow situations. It is just because of the incorporation of F1 and F2. Correct. Now, usually as, as we have, what we do, we usually take up the one dimensional approach. So, in the one dimensional approach, if, if we take the equations reduced to this particular form, which is quite evident to you. Now, in our case, if and for steady state conditions, if we find that for steady state conditions, when the inertia dominant conditions are there, then naturally the left hand side disappears off, the left hand side which was here this disappears off and this portion becomes equal to 0, this portion becomes equal to 0 which I have written down. B1 is nothing but minus rho 1 g. I have considered the direction of flow to be positive or the upward direction to be positive. So, naturally your B1 becomes minus, minus rho 1 g, B2 becomes minus rho 2 g. Okay? One dimensional, so therefore they become minus dp dz. Okay. Now, in this particular case, you tell me what should be included in F1 and what should be included in F2. Two phases are flowing. How they are flowing, how they are distributed, we are not concerned about it. But we know in whatever way they are flowing, in whatever way they are distributed, more or less what will happen? What will be the forces acting on fluid 1 other than the pressure drop force? It has to arise from the wall and it has to arise between f uh, due to the f uh, uh, interaction between fluid 1 and fluid 2. These two forces have to arise. Okay? Now, considering the interaction of the fluid with the wall, naturally if the flow direction is in the upward direction, this interaction will be in the opposite direction, is not it? So, suppose you say that two fluids are flowing in this particular way. Okay. Since both the fluids are flowing, your F w 1 and F w 2, they should be in the downward direction, quite natural. Okay. The other thing is, the, there will be interaction between the gas phase as well as the liquid phase. Okay. Now, assuming that the phase 2 is the gas phase or whatever it is, the phase 2 is the discontinuous phase, it has a higher velocity as compared to the liquid phase. Okay. So, therefore, the hydrodynamic drag in which direction is it going to act? It will be acting in the direction opposite to the direction of motion for the gas phase and it will be acting in the direction of motion for the liquid phase. Just like we decide your, so this should be the thing, is not it? And this F12, this is for the gas phase louder yeah you can take it as f21 also but if the it's mutual hydrodynamic drag then in that case can't we say f12 equals to minus f21 equals to or in other words the better thing will be sorry f21 is nothing but equal to minus f12 if you take F21, then it is fine. Okay, you can take it in any direction. Okay, but since I I think that both these forces they are equal and opposite, so therefore F21 will be equal to minus F12. That's why I have not differentiated between these two. Otherwise, what I would have done F12 for the liquid phase and F21 again in the upward direction for the gas phase. Gas to liquid, liquid to gas. 
Now we know that gas to liquid and liquid to gas the hydrodynamic drags are equal and opposite. So instead of F21 in the upward direction, I put F12 in the downward direction for the gas phase. Agreed? So these are the forces which should act. Now remember one thing. When I was defining this particular F repeatedly I have told you one thing that this is per unit volume of that individual phase. Do you remember this thing that F1 is the leftover force per unit volume of phase 1, F2 is the leftover force per unit volume of phase 2. Agreed? Because both these equations if you observe this equation and this equation, this is written down per unit volume of phase 1, this is written per unit volume of phase 2. Okay, now if we combine the mixture as a whole, then this small f1 and small f2, these things if they have to be expressed in terms of per unit volume of the total mixture, then in that case in what way it should be expressed? In that case f1 for into 1 minus alpha is per unit volume of total flow field. Tell me if there is any doubt regarding this. F2 alpha is per unit volume of total flow field where F2 is per unit volume of fluid 2, F1 is per unit volume of fluid 1. Is it clear to you? This particular portion, this particular transformation which has to be done and this is denoted as capital F1, this is denoted as capital F2. Now tell me whether, th whether this particular part is clear to you. What we did? First we we found out that finding out the constitutive equation, it is much more advantageous to use the two fluid model. What is the two fluid model? We consider the two fluid separately, we write the momentum equation for fluid 1, we write the momentum equation for fluid 2. We did it in the, in the three dimensional form in this particular way. We are always considering one dimensional form, so this is the equation that we get. Now in this particular equation the only thing which has to be decided is regarding F1 and F2. Okay? Now the point is this small F1 and small F2 they should consider for interaction of fluid 1 with the wall, interaction of fluid 1 with fluid 2. Agreed? For fluid 2, interaction of fluid 2 with the wall, interaction of fluid 2 with fluid 1. Agreed? So therefore, it should contain something like FW1 and F12 and the other one FW2 and F21. Now we know that the drags at the interfaces, they are equal and opposite. So F21 equals minus F12. Okay? So therefore, F1 should contain FW1 and F12 and your F2 should contain FW2 and minus F12. Now what about the directions of these two things? Remember regarding the directions we have considered the upper direction as positive. Okay? So therefore if that is so then in that case your FW1, FW2 they will be negative. Agreed? Achha. F12 it will be negative for phase 2 and F12 it will be positive for phase 1 assuming phase 1 assuming phase 2 travels faster it is the lighter phase. On this assumption these are the signs, sign conventions which we can use agreed. Achha. After that so therefore in F1 and F2 in this F1 and F2 we, we have FW1, F12, FW2, F12 or minus F12, fine. Now you try to understand this F1 and F2, they were 
per unit volume of that particular fluid. Now, if we have to equate to see FW1, FW2 or in other words F12 and F, F21, if we have to de relate them, then they have to be expressed on one particular volume basis, is not it? It cannot be vo your volume of phase 1, per unit volume of phase 1 and per unit volume of phase 2. In that way, we cannot correlate F12 and F21, can we? Both of them have to be expressed on the basis of the same volume element. What will it be? The mixture volume. So, therefore, they have to be expressed in terms of per unit volume of the mixture. Do you agree? Now, if we take per unit volume of the mixture, then also your V1 that is going to be minus rho 1 g for vertical or is minus rho 1 g cos theta or something in this particular case. V 2 it will minus rho 2 g cos theta, okay, I will write it down, it's cos or sin for whatever the case may be. Okay, even if it is per unit volume of the entire flow field also, these things are not going to change. Do you get the point? Because per unit volume these are the things which are remaining, okay. Uh, but if we consider per unit volume of the flow element, then in that case the contribution from phase 1, contribution from phase 1 per unit volume of total, per unit volume of total flow, then this will naturally become F1 into 1 minus alpha. Do you get my point? Because in that per unit volume, there is alpha alpha volume of phase 2, 1 minus alpha volume of phase 1. Okay, so, therefore, the, the net contribution of 1 on unit volume of the total flow has to be F1 into 1 minus alpha. This we simply denote as capital F1. Similarly, contribution from phase 2 per unit volume of total flow this will be F2 into alpha which we denote as F2, agreed? And where we find what is F1 equals to? F1 this will be equal to F12 minus FW1 considering the signs, clear to you? What is F2 equals to? This will be minus F12 minus FW2, in other words minus F12 plus F W 2. Clear to all of you? Is not it? So, therefore, instead of the F 1 and F 2 which we had got here, we have to substitute the equations which we have got. We have to substitute instead of F 1, we can substitute F 1 by 1 minus alpha and in that F 1 by 1 minus alpha, we can substitute this thing by 1 minus alpha. Anything you do not uh, understand, you tell me to repeat. Similarly, instead of F2, we have to substitute F2 by alpha. F2 by alpha means this by alpha or this by alpha. Got the point? We have simply done that substitution and we have got this particular. We have accordingly, I have written it down here also. We can make these substitutions and finally, we arrive at these two equations for the two fluid model. Okay. Now, remember how have we accounted for the different interfacial phase distributions by different expressions of F12. That is the way we have tried to incorporate the different interfacial distributions. Now, if we subtract one equation from the other, what do we get? If we subtract say equation 2 from equation 1 or something. Then in that case, what do we expect to get? You just subtract it and then tell me what is the equation that you are going to get on subtracting? We will get something like 0 equals to rho 2 minus rho 1 into g plus f 1 2 by 1 minus alpha plus f 1 2 by alpha, is not it? Just by subtracting we get this. Or in other words, if you want to express F12, then this becomes 1 by 1 minus alpha plus 1 by alpha, this is rho 1 minus rho 2 into g. Or in other words, F12 equals to what? 
it has to be alpha into 1 minus alpha into rho 1 minus rho 2 into g, is not it? And this particular equation, what does it represent? It represents a balance between fluid dynamic drag and buoyancy. Clear to all of you what I had tried to do? So, thing is what we did first, we first wrote down the momentum balance equations and then for we took it for steady state conditions under inertia domain. If, if you see the PPT, you will notice that initially what we did, we did it for the steady state inertia dominant conditions, we got this. Then we substituted F1 and F2. Okay. They will be having terms arising from hydrodynamic drag and wall shear stress. Now, usually what we have done is we have neglected the wall shear stress effects. Okay. We have tried to consider that particular situation where hydrodynamic drag is much more important. Under such a situation, we have written down the two equations. Okay. This is where we can neglect the hydrodynamic drag, sorry, we can neglect the wall shear stress and basically this gives a balance between your buoyancy as well as the fluid dynamic drag. Then we have, we have subtracted one equation from the other and we find that in the absence of wall effects, remember this is something very, very important. We have obtained this particular equation only under a situation where hydrodynamic drag is important and that is balanced by buoyancy. We have neglected your wall interaction and definitely if uh, this is ap applicable for gas liquid cases, if it is particle fluid cases, then we have also neglected particle particle interaction. It is just hydrodynamic drag and your buoyancy. From that particular balance in the absence of wall effects under steady state conditions for inertia dominant cases, we have got this particular equation. Agreed? And from this particular equation, what do we find? This particular equation which has been obtained as a balance between buoyancy and fluid dynamic drag, what do we get? We find that F12, it is a function of what? Component properties, it is a function of void fraction and naturally void fraction is a function of interfacial geometry and it also has to depend upon the relative motion. Isn't it? So, from this particular equation we get, let me see if I have it, no I do not have it. From this particular equation what we get? We get F12, it is a function of one is component properties. If you see it logically you will find that these are the things on which F12 depends. Then it has to be void fraction. Now, void fraction for all flow patterns, the relationship or variation of void fraction is not the same. Void fraction depends upon interfacial geometry and definitely relative motion. On these things, F12 has to depend. Now, for a given system, if we consider a given system, What do we find for a given system? Component properties, they become constant, is not it? And, so, and void fraction is dependent upon the interfacial geometry. Your relative motion is dependent upon your interfacial geometry. So, therefore, for a given system F12, that becomes a function of alpha and the relative motion. Do you get my point? Okay. Accordingly, we can also write, therefore, if F12 is a function of all these things, then J21 or J12, whatever it is, in whatever way, that should also be a function of your alpha and your system properties as well as interfacial geometry, yes or no? Tell me if you, because since I cannot interact much with you, so 
you should be telling me to repeat the things or whether you have understood or not understood you should communicate with me ok. So, therefore, from the basic equation which we had got from this particular basic equation for do we get f 1 to it is a function of component properties, void fraction, interfacial geometry or interfacial configuration and your relative motion. Relative motion in whatever way you can express it, it can be relative velocity, it can be drift flux whatever it is ok. Now, if that is so, then norm automatically from there from this particular equation for do we get in j 2 1 or j 1 2 whatever that should be a function of component properties, void fraction and interfacial geometry right. And therefore, for any particular given system. j 2 1 that is a function of for if a system becomes fixed then naturally your system properties become fixed ok and alpha and interfacial geometry they are they are dependent on one another agreed. So, therefore, for a given system j 1 2 or j 2 1 that is a function of alpha only did you get my point. So, what do we find? We find that the relative velocity or the drift flux both of them u 2 j as well as j 2 1 they are function of alpha only. They depend upon the drag forces acting at the interface as well as the interfacial geometry. So, therefore, your relative velocity as well as drift velocity they are a function of alpha only but this functional form it should be different for different interfacial structures. Is this part clear to you? For did we deduce f 1 2 is a function of component properties I think I have got a slide over this yeah f 1 2 we found, found out that it is a function of component properties then void fraction, interfacial geometry, relative motion etcetera ok. From this PPT also I have written it down. Now, if that is true then in that case we find j 2 1 that should also depend upon void fraction, system properties etcetera etcetera. Now, moment we fix up this system then j 2 1 should be a function of alpha only and this particular functional form the functional form of this particular equation that should depend on interfacial distribution or in other words the type of equation which will describe the relationship between j 2 1 and alpha that should be different for different flow patterns agreed. And I will be giving you a set of the equations which are used for different flow conditions, but in general with lot of experiments what people have found, people have found that more or less your j 2 1 that depends upon usually two things. One is it can be expressed in terms of say there is a discontinuous phase and a continuous phase. So, it depends upon the velocity of one discont maybe if it is bubbly flow then one bubble velocity of one discontinuous particle in an infinite medium of phase 1 of velocity of one discontinuous particle means velocity of one discontinuous particle of phase 2 in an infinite medium of phase 1 ok and it also depends upon alpha. And usually this particular functional form that people have obtained as j 2 1 by u infinity equals to alpha into 1 minus alpha whole to the power n or in other words you can also write it down as j 2 1 equals to u infinity alpha into 1 minus alpha whole to the power n. So, what people have done? People have tried to find out some particular relationship between j 2 1 and alpha and what did people find? 
people found out that usually for a wide range of, of flow conditions, maybe for bubbly, for slack, for churn, for fluidized bed, for a wide range of conditions people have found that a generalized functional form which is given in this particular way, the generalized functional form can be used for different flow conditions. What is the difference? When we take different flow patterns, only the, the value of u infinity and n are different for each of the flow patterns. If you take a fluid particle system, you will have some value of u infinity and n. For bubbly flow, some value of u infinity n. For slug flow, some value of u infinity and n. In this way, we account for different values of or rather uh, we account for the influence of the different flow patterns on J21 by using this particular equation. So, therefore, for all the equations for all the all flow conditions we find J21 is a function of alpha. The functional form can be represented by a generalized equation given in this particular functional form. Okay? And this is a general equation for all types of flow patterns which can be predicted by the drift flux model. But for different flow patterns what we have? For different flow patterns this value of u infinity and n are different. What is there? It is simply a function or constant which varies with flow patterns. What is u infinity? It is the velocity of a single discontinuous phase in an infinite medium of the continuous phase. If it is gas liquid bubbly flow, it is the rise velocity of a single bubble in an infinite liquid medium. If it is a fluidized bed sort of a system, then in that case it is the velocity of a single solid particle or the terminal velocity of a single solid particle falling in an infinite medium of the fluid. If it is slug flow, then u infinity is the velocity of a single Taylor bubble in an inf without the wall effects. So, accordingly u infinity is different for different flow situations, n is different for different flow situations and accordingly by incorporating different values of u infinity and n, we can find out j21 for different flow situations, correct. Now, for certain cases, the value of u2, j and j21 have been proposed in several textbooks. I have just written down these particular equations for your convenience. Okay? So, for the viscous flow regime, these equations they are just, just, for, your, uh, just for you to note, you need not memorize them or you need not remember them. For the viscous regime, this is the equation. Then for the Newton's regime, this is the equation. And then for distorted fluid particle, again we have different things. For the churn turbulent flow regime, this sort of these are equations for u 2 j. We know that alpha into u 2 j is nothing but j 2 1. Okay? And just I would like to mention what is this churn and for the bubbly uh, sorry for the uh, slug flow for, uh, probably this is the equation. Yeah, for the churn turbulent flow regime, churn turbulent flow regime is a bubbly flow pattern where the bubbles are can be of different sorts of sizes and shapes. It is just a transition between the bubbly flow pattern and the slug flow pattern. Normally, what do we say? We say that for the bubbly flow pattern, we have bubbles of this sort. For the slug flow pattern, we have something of this sort. Okay? Now, for the churn turbulent flow pattern, we can have a wide type of bubbles, we can have cap bubbles, it can be a totally erratic distribution resembling the churn flow regime to some extent. Okay? So, therefore, usually this particular flow pattern which is a transition between these two, this is usually known as the churn turbulent flow regime. Okay? And we find that for number of situations, we neither operate here nor operate here, we operate in the churn turbulent flow pattern. This is one type of bubbly flow pattern which marks the transition between the bubbly and the slug flow patterns. Okay? Now, for this particular case, people have, have 
proposed this equation for u t j and people have said that when it is gas liquid system root 2 is fine and when it is a liquid liquid system then instead of root 2 1.57 is better. So, these are simply empirical equations in case you have to do you have to sort out any problem with the flux model according depending upon the situation you select a particular u 2 j from this u 2 j you select a you, you find out a particular j 2 1 that j 2 1 you apply and then you find out alpha rho mixture and whatever other things are there ok and th this particular equation this is for the slug flow pattern. So, for different flow patterns we have different particular flow equations or rather different expressions of drift velocity depending upon your case you are supposed to select it and you are supposed to do it. But just remember whatever equation you use whatever you do more or less we find that this particular equation can be used rather so naturally u 2 j becomes this equation u 2 j people have proposed it is a function of u infinity and the hold up of the continuous phase. From there people have found j 2 1 can be obtained from this particular expression and where u infinity and n depend upon the different flow conditions. The only two limiting conditions which have to be taken into mind while using this particular equation is that j 2 1 has to be 0 at alpha equal to 0, j 2 1 has to be 0 at alpha equal to 1. These are the two limiting conditions which have to be agreed upon by all equations which we use to find out j 2 1 ok. So, this was all about the kinematic constitute or rather the how the kinematic constitutive equation has been proposed to find out j 2 1. So, now what we have? We have two equations, we have two unknowns. What are the two equations that we have? One equation was one which we derived from the drift flux model which gave us j 2 1 equals to j 2 plus alpha j is not it. And the other equation we have j 2 1 equals to u infinity alpha into 1 minus alpha whole to the power n. There are two unknowns one is j 2 1 one is alpha and we have two equations. So, we can solve them simultaneously and we can get a value of alpha we can get a value of j 2 1 and from there we can get value of different mixture properties agreed. Now, how will we will solve them simultaneous solution is definitely one, but we would prefer a graphical solution because graphical solution will enable us to take into account the different flow directions of the different uh, uh, flows. It will also help us to account for the different um, the effect of varying the phase flow risk. So, in the next class we will take up these two equations we will try to solve them or rather we will the simultaneous solution will be done by a graphical technique and we will see what are the different information that we can get from those graphical technique, what are the different ways of representing the two equations graphically and accordingly we will proceed ok. Thank you very much.